Welcome to The F Word, a podcast series that examines, excavates, unpicks and reframes forgiveness through the lives of others. I'm Marina Cantacuzino, a journalist from London, founder of the Forgiveness Project charity, and I've built my career investigating how those who face the most complex and devastating things in life find a way through. I'll be talking fortnightly to a guest who's experienced something very difficult or traumatic in their life, but who rather than respond with hate or bitterness, has embraced, or at the very least considered, forgiveness as a response to pain. I was now coming face to face with the person who was responsible for Lindy's death. I had this perception of an evil person. For the first time, I met someone whose daughter died as a result of my command. So what you heard there were a few clips from the award-winning film Beyond Forgiving, which tells the story of how my guest today, Let Lapa Mafaleli, came to meet Jin Furi, the mother of one of his victims. Letlapa was once the commander of the Azanian People's Liberation Army in South Africa during the bitter and brutal years of apartheid. And he planned and ordered the attack, which in 1993 saw student Lindy Furi gunned down and murdered in a bar in Cape Town. Nine years later, Letlapa, having avoided both the Truth and Reconciliation Commission and prison, was promoting his memoir at a book launch in Cape Town when Jin turned up to confront him. So this is very much a shared narrative and one that I think beautifully represents a model for repairing broken communities and mending broken hearts. Lapa, it's it's an incredibly moving, deep, difficult story. Yes. That you choose to go public with, you choose to tell in many different ways. Indeed. Um, I think it would be useful perhaps to start with this hatred that you must have experienced every day of your life perhaps you yourself were demonized as a black young man growing up in south africa during the apartheid era how did that rub off on you in the sense that um the way you treated others during those years of apartheid yeah it is a common thing that once you have a master loading over you, you aspire to be one. And obviously you cannot be a master of your master. You look around human beings who look inferior to you. And these are some of the negative traits that I had imbued from the master race, the white people. For instance, when we were in exile in Botswana, there was a time when we had to play people in the neighboring village, and those people happened to be the Khoisans, commonly known as the Bushmen. By the way, he's referring here to playing a game of football, football being one of Latlapa's greatest passions. They outplayed us, but we won the game because the referee was one of us. And at the end of the game, we all summed it up in one phrase. We could not let the Bushmen beat us. So we had superior airs to people who were different to us. So it's easy to see the oppressor next door and ignore the the oppressor in oneself. Did you recognise that about yourself at the time? Or is it something now that looking back you see those tendencies in you to actually look down on others as you were looked down on? Well, at the time, I saw nothing wrong. And I'm not trying to say I I have outlived that. Uh, I think the damage is indelible. Uh, I still have hangovers of that. But they manifest themselves differently. For instance, one time I was flying And to my shock and horror, the pilot was a black man and I felt as if the plane was going to crash. 
Now, then I ask myself, am I liberated? Certainly not. So, that up a, a very famous quote by Gandhi is, an eye for an eye makes the whole world blind. And you once said something which really made an impression on me and actually made this quote very real for me. Um, I don't know if you remember, but you said, and I'm quoting you here, I believed then that terror had to be answered with terror. And I authorised high profile massacres on white civilians in the same way that the whites did on us. At the time, it seemed the only valid response. But where would it have ended? If my enemy had been cannibals, would I have eaten white flesh? If my enemy had raped black women, would I have raped white women? I mean, how does that thinking start to change? Where does it lead, this cycle of revenge? It escalates and it ends in, in terror and appalling acts of, of harm and atrocity. So was it gradual, that change of thinking, away from an eye for an eye? Yes, indeed. And because people who I regarded as enemies, I demonized them. It, it, is, it was gradual, indeed. And still, it's a journey. I wouldn't say I've reached it. So sometimes, uh, if, if somebody doesn't greet me, I don't greet them. So just to repeat that, that Lapa is saying that sometimes, if somebody doesn't greet him, he won't greet them back. So those people have set standards for me, which are very low standards. And it's an inner struggle. It, it was gradual in the sense that, and credit to Jean as well, because we discussed at length violence, anger, and the implications. And I actually realized that I was a coward, because if the enemy punches you, you punch back that is cowardice, but if you disarm or you ridicule the enemy by not stooping to their level, I admire those people who, in the face of provocation, they don't stoop to the methods of the people who have provoked them. So it's a, it was very gradual and it is still a struggle for me. I wouldn't say I'm there yet. Are there examples, Letlapa, of things today that in many ways should have changed and your feelings should have changed, but you're just sort of stuck into an old way of thinking and feeling? Yes, it's a struggle that I'm going through. And many times I find that my heart is not aligned to my head. For instance, many years after South Africa attained freedom, and normalized sport and other cultural codes, I find it very, very hard to support the Springboks. Even though it's a black and white team now? Well, even though the captain sometimes is a black person, but uh, I haven't moved with times. Um, and I support anyone who plays against them. And I get disappointed when the Springboks win. However, to challenge my heart, I had to summon my head uh, and I bought a Springbok jersey and a cap. A jersey and a cap? A, a jersey and a cap. So whenever Springboks play, I wear them. And the warmth, the friendship and the reception that I get, especially from elderly white people who see me as a fellow compatriot supporting the national team. Uh, and when they do that, uh, I feel that I should reciprocate, I should return their warmth, the, the, the greetings, you know, uh, and even their well wishes. But at that level, I enjoy their warmth. But my heart will be different from what my head is saying now. It's an inner struggle. I love that example of a jumper and a cat being a sort of instrument of building mm. shared, mm. shared humanity. Mm. Mm. 
Yes, uh, which means I'm doing something on it. Exactly. Uh, I could fold, you know, and let the, the past take hold of me. But uh, sometimes I, I, I make small little attempts at normalizing myself. You said once that you had demonized people you were fighting against. But when people started to reach out to you like Jin, it was like an opening of a world that was until then closed to you. And you said it was one of the most profound and humbling experiences of your life. Yes, yes, indeed. So, Lelapa, you've spoken your story with Jin a lot, but now Jin has moved to be with her son in Australia. So I presume you see much less of her, and yet it is a shared narrative. Um, how does it feel talking, you know, about this thing and this relationship and friendship that you've developed? How does it feel doing that on your own without Jin by your side? I feel inadequate. The story is incomplete without Jin on the stage with me because she's the initiator of the journey. And much as we communicate frequently, but her physical presence in the telling of the story is highly desirable. It's very useful to have the film Beyond Forgiving, isn't it? Which tells your story and has a lot of interview footage with Jin. So at least people have a real sense of who she is and where she's coming from. Mm -hmm. True. What about the sort of cathartic nature of sharing your story? I imagine you wouldn't do it if it didn't serve you as well as there's an altruistic element and a, a form of meaning making and wanting to help people understand the context and how people can recover and heal after violence. But it's not just that, is it? It must help you as well to talk about what happened and why why you were involved in the violent struggle? I think the journey that Jean and I, I embarked on is part of storytelling because we met at the book launch. And what, what was that book about? It, it was about a story. And even the reason why I wrote the book, because I wrote the book when I was underground, I, I had foreseen my death and I did not want to die without leaving something that would outlive me. And what would be that something would be a story. So storytelling is, is releasing. And once people have time to tell their story, they feel better. I feel that with, with me, especially if a person could listen to you. And those who had reached out to me, they did not reach out to me uh, over a cup of tea and we parted. They had a story and I had my story and we had to reconcile our stories. Jen is a white Christian woman. You are a black atheist man. You come from incredibly different backgrounds, different stories, different history. And I've seen you together many times. There's a real connection between you which it sounds to me you didn't have to work very hard at. Is that right or is that wrong? Well, I didn't have to work very hard at that. And thanks to Jean, she carried a lot of the weight that I was supposed to carry. And as we have said, the contrast is massive. One atheist, one Christian. And I've learned to appreciate the fact that forgiveness has little, if not nothing, to do with one's beliefs or the absence of them. She was very open always, wasn't she, to, yeah. to including you in her life. Yeah. Um, you first met Jim Farin in 2002 when she turned up at your book launch in Cape Town. She confronted you from the audience, but afterwards, when you went up to her, she described seeing remorse in your eyes 
And she said to me about that moment, she said it would have been so much easier if he had been a monster with horns and a tail. I think she meant it would have been so much easier to hate you. And yet she came to forgive you. And I'm really interested to know how that happened and what effect this gift of forgiveness had on you, Let Love. On my side, I thought or I wished she didn't forgive me because as, as soon as she forgave me, I felt a burden of responsibility weighing down my shoulders. It is easy to be unforgiven because you don't have to prove anything. But to be forgiven, you get your humanity restored and at the same time, you have to reciprocate that. And that becomes a debt that needs repayment for the rest of one's life. Daily, you have to prove that you are worth forgiving or you are worthy of forgiveness. It is not easy to be forgiven because you have to rise to the occasion. Have you been challenged with it? Seriously challenged. For instance, I always ask myself if I were to be in Jean's position, losing a close relative and I know who the killers are, would I forgive? I don't find it easy. But then there will be a reminder, you have been forgiven. How did she come to forgive you? Was it instantaneous or was it a pro long process? I mean, from that, when I say instantaneous, from that moment of her meeting and seeing you as a human being, seeing your humanity. I couldn't to her the first time we met at Cape Town Press Lab book launch. She saw remorsefulness in my eyes. Remorsefulness? That's what she said. And when we had the second meeting and she looked me in the eye, then she offered me that gift of forgiveness. But she was honest to say if she had met me immediately after the incident, she could have throttled my throat. But there was a time lapse of nine years. I first met her nine years after the incident. I did not ask forgiveness from Jean, but all I wanted her to do was to listen to my story. And it came as a bonus, unexpectedly, the gift of forgiveness. How did that forgiveness affect you in the sense of how you viewed the world, how you felt about yourself? People talk about forgiveness as liberating, both for the person who's been harmed, but also for the person who's being forgiven. They talk about it as a opening, as a lightness. How did it actually feel for you? Forgiveness goes straight to the heart, the heart of the forgiven. And it was hugely liberating. Just before she forgave me, I was pardoned by the state, but I felt nothing. And later on, a journalist wrote that after Jean had forgiven me, I was released from prison, literally so. And Jean wanted to take up the story with the journalist for infectious reporting and I said to her no actually that's how I felt I felt like being released from prison and when you are forgiven you regret what you have done but at the same time you imagine in the event of no forgiveness how would I feel but if you are forgiven you you feel liberated at least it was the case in my situation I can't let what Lapa said there pass without referring to Nelson Mandela's famous statement on release from prison following decades behind bars. In an astonishingly insightful moment, and knowing his work to unite the country meant he'd have to reach out to people on all sides, he declared, As I walked out the door toward the gate that would lead to my freedom, I knew if I didn't leave my bitterness and hatred behind, I'd still be in prison. Another moment of catharsis that has been described in your story, Jin talks about it and you've referred to it often, is when you invited Jin 
to your homecoming. This was after you'd met her at the book launch. It was your homecoming in the village. And it was an extraordinary, brave thing for you to do in a way. It could have backfired terribly to invite a white woman just shortly after the end of apartheid to your home. What, what motivated you to do that? And what happened at that event? Because Jean had given me that gift of forgiveness. And that was a small token of appreciation to invite her to my homecoming ceremony. And later on, of course, uh, there was a time when she spent uh, three weeks in my village. And we had a line-up of speakers. By the speaker of the day, even by the response of the audience, was Jean. For obvious reasons, she wasn't a politician, and one could not have misinterpreted her speech to be a vote catcher. She was speaking from the heart, and what she said was moving to the audience, especially when she acknowledged the painful history of the African people. And not only that, went on to apologize on behalf of her ancestors. I think it was at that moment when the hall exploded. Actually, the hall was, there were more people outside there were, than they were inside. Yeah. She apologized for slavery, for colonialism. And for apartheid. And for apartheid, yes. yes. Mm. Very powerful moment. And uh, a very unusual moment like that. People don't do that. No, white people don't do that. I, I, well, until then, I hadn't had a white person doing it. Uh, it was just for the first time I had a white person apologizing the way Jean was apologizing. Yes, politicians, when they need votes, they can go an extra mile. But normally, they wouldn't be meaning it. But with her, she was meaning every word she was saying. And what struck me is, even white on white violence, she had on many occasions apologized to the Africaners, to the Boers, for the concentration camps that the English had. And I've seen people, you know, tearful when she, she did that. And part back to the storytelling, no compensation in terms of money, nothing material, but it, it, it performs magic in the hearts of people that here is a person who wasn't even born during the atrocities, but on behalf of her ascendants, uh, she's apologizing. Incredibly powerful. When an apology is sincere, comes mm. from the heart, mm. it can move things along, can't mm. it? Mm. The recognition and the acknowledgement. True. And she says a very powerful, moving story um, in the film Beyond Forgiving, which I recently rewatched. Um, she describes a moment when he, at that ceremony where a young black man comes up to her and wants a photograph mm. taken mm. with her. And he says, I have mm. to have a photograph to take it back to my home and my mm family in my village mm. to show them that a white person understands mm. 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 it's it's moving it's horrifying mm. that that mm. is that was and mm. I, I think in many cases still is so unusual that mm. response mm. Jin's response yes. the truth and reconciliation commission I recently heard someone say something interesting which I never heard before um, it's an expert, it's a man who runs the Restitution Institute in South Africa. And he was saying that he felt one of the shortfalls of the commission was that they only looked at extreme atrocities, extreme violations, that they didn't look at the everyday humiliations. And for that reason, white South Africans today do not see themselves as complicit. It was a white man himself speaking. It was a strong, broad statement. And obviously there are exceptions. Do you recognise that? Yes, indeed. Uh, because judges or the judiciary during the apartheid were asked to, to appear before the TLC. 
So he's talking here about how judges and the judiciary were not forced to testify in front of the TRC. The TRC stands for the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, which was a court-like restorative justice body assembled in South Africa after the end of apartheid. For the first time, victims and perpetrators of gross human rights abuses came face to face, testifying in an attempt to heal wounds and to move forward. And yes, uh, judges were asked to, to appear before the TRC, and they refused, because there were four categories under which a person was supposed to appear before the TRC. I think it's murder, uh, abduction, torture, and excessive violence. Uh, not necessarily in that order. But not only that, I had a problem when the business, white business uh, fraternity, refused to go to the TRC, and they never appeared before the TRC. Now, the business a, a, a sector, they are the biggest benefactors of apartheid and colonialism because they got the cheapest labor imaginable based on race, but now all those things were not uh, considered because they were not extreme. And yes, uh, even at the time of the TRC, I had a problem when we confined these to extreme violence and other forms of extreme extremisms. Yeah, and the impact remains today. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I want to thank you, Letlapa, for talking to me today. The work you and Jin are doing together to promote peace is, is such a powerful example of reconciliation. You once described your connection with Jin as meeting soul to soul, person to person. And I think this makes possibly the greatest catalyst for change. So I want to really thank you, Letlapa, for talking to, talking to me on the F Word podcast. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thank you for listening to the F Word podcast. To dig a bit deeper around some of the themes we've talked about, do check out the show notes by going to theforgivenessproject.com slash podcast. And from there, you can also explore the Forgiveness Project website, which over the years has collected and shared many more stories of how people have transformed the darkest of situations. I also want to invite you to join the F Word Podcast Facebook group, especially if you have more to discuss or share. Again, to find the link, go to theforgivenessproject.com slash F Word Podcast. And finally, all these podcasts have grown out of years of trying to shift the narrative of our time away from one of hate and division towards empathy and understanding. So if you've enjoyed this podcast, please do consider donating even just the smallest amount to help us continue our work. All details of how to do this, again, are on the show notes page of our website. But most of all, I hope you'll join me again when next time on the F Word podcast, I'll be talking to Azim Kamiza, an American Sufi Muslim whose only son was gunned down by a pizza delivery boy in San Diego in 1995. Azim has since reached out to support his son's killer and he works relentlessly to prevent further youth violence.